So welcome to our webinar. Thanks everybody for, for joining. Let's have a look at the agenda of the next 60 minutes. So we'll um, give you an intro of our expert panelists today uh, with us. And then I briefly highlight the, the rationale uh, why we are doing this webinar. Then uh, we'll get an intro by uh, Anders uh, Isaksson about uh, the Nordic market, especially the, the Swedish uh, market and uh, NGM, the stock exchange is working for. Then we'll have uh, our panel uh, discussion. It will be interactive, so you can also um, We'll ask you a, a question or two. And then at the end, uh, you, we will also pick up the questions uh, that you raised during the webinar. And uh, so please, please uh, use the opportunity and um, bring in your questions. We will uh, collect them and pick them up uh, for the, the end of the session uh, Q&A. So now it's a, a great pleasure to me um, to introduce you to our experts on the panel. Uh, let's maybe start with the Swedish uh, panelists. Uh, we have on, on the left uh, is Anders uh, Isaksson, is the head of equity at Nordic Growth Market. Uh, NGM is a regulated market uh, with headquarters in Stockholm. They also operate the uh, MTFs in the Nordics. Anders is heading up the equity sales, equity listing and product development team at NGM. He has previously spent 30 years in investment banking, corporate communications and management consulting and has huge experience in dealing with small and mid caps. Then uh, we have Oscar Carling. Uh, Oscar is the head of corporate sales and investment banking at the Swedish security firm uh, Mangold Fond Commission. He has many years of experience in investment banking and extensive knowledge and a huge network in the Nordic markets. Then uh, Thomas Rauch, uh, our Swiss participant, is corporate advisor at the Swiss firm Elaborix. He has over 20 years of experience in investment banking and asset management. He's a focus on Swiss small and mid caps. He began his career as a sell side equity analyst for the international top tier investment banks with a focus on Swiss and European small and mid caps. After several years in the equity market, Thomas moved to the asset management industry, where he acted as portfolio and asset manager at several firms. Furthermore, is the founder owner of an investment, investor relations and analytics firm with a focus on Swiss and small caps. So great. Um, my name is Matthias Müller. I'm a member of the executive board at BX Swiss and I'm um, heading the sales. So a few words to who BX Swiss, uh, who we are, um, in case you don't, don't know us. Um, we are headquartered in, in Switzerland since 2018. Uh, we belong to Börse Stuttgart Group. Börse Stuttgart Group comprises of three European uh, stock exchanges. So um, this, um, this NGM today represented by Andres Isaksson um, in, in the Nordics. So they have a huge network and experience uh, on, in all the Nordic markets, but we will especially focus on the Swedish market today. Just, uh, just briefly, other, uh, in case you, you don't know, in Switzerland we have uh, three uh, stock exchanges, regulated uh, markets, operat operative, uh, it's BX Swiss and of course six Swiss exchange and, uh, and the newly established SD, SDX um, trading that is focusing on, on tokenized assets. Um, in Switzerland, MTFs as, uh, as platforms don't really um, play an important role. This is uh, different in, in the Nordics, uh, where there are also various MTFs uh, operating um, uh, trading platforms. Can you switch? Thank you. And when, when the OSCD uh, issued that report last year, uh, that I think that was, was the, the moment uh, where we decided to, to, um, to have these webinars. Uh, the last webinar we did is London Stock Exchange on the AIM market. Uh, today now um, we are focusing on, on, on Sweden. Um, and I, I found this, uh, these graphs here uh, quite shocking. Other, uh, 
the, there were overall more delistings uh, in, in the past years than, than listings for quite some time. And I think this is a very negative uh, trend and the industry, all market participants, we need to, to put our heads together and, uh, and think about what, what can be done uh, to re reverse that trend. Can we switch to the next slide, please? And then um, also that that really hit me um, where you see the top 20 IPO countries uh, worldwide. Um, there are six European countries in the, in the top 20. That's good news, but the bad news is Switzerland is, uh, is not on that list. And um, that basically led, led, uh, led to this webinar. And then um, when we look, just look at the, the past, um, past years, so since 2013, we didn't, uh, we didn't even achieve 60, uh, over 60 listings in Switzerland. This is less than, uh, than um, Sweden did in the last year. So much, uh, much less than Sweden did uh, over 100 uh, listings uh, last year. And so this le leads to the question, the basic question of the webinar, what can we learn from Sweden, and now I'm, I'm giving over to you, Anders, and you can explain us um, how, how it works in Sweden. Thank you, Matthias. Uh, it's great to be here at your webinar and have the opportunity to uh, talk about the uniqueness of Sweden and the Swedish IPO market and the financial ecosystem that we have created in Sweden over maybe 30 years uh, for SME companies. Uh, so, uh, please, can you turn to the first page? Thank you very much. I'll start off a bit from the top, just to put sort of the Swedish IPO market on the map. Um, there's been, of course, a very extremely busy year uh, in the Nordics in terms of IPOs. As you can see on this chart on the left side, actually 45% of all European IPOs in 2021 were Nordic IPOs, which is quite astonishing. If you look at the middle uh, graph here in, in the Nordics, you can see that we already in 2020, we had a very, very strong IPO year. But in 2021, uh, we grew with 126% in, in the number of, of listings. Um, the number of listed companies per capita in, 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 in the Nordics is remarkably high. In Sweden, for instance, we have a population of only 10 million people, and we have more than 1,000 listed companies, uh, more than both Germany and France, for instance, who have about 800 companies listed each. So that's, you know, we're quite proud of that. Um, what is also quite remarkable is the dominance of MTF listings, as you can see on this uh, right-hand chart. Uh, and these numbers are from 2020. Over 90% of the IPOs were listed on MTF platforms compared to regulated platforms. Please go to the next uh, slide. Uh, these are also some numbers uh, for, for, from, from 2020. And uh, here you can see so that there are the unique structure of, of the Nordic IPO market. Uh, on the right hand chart, you can see that there is a significant focus on small and micro cap companies in relation to mid and large caps when you look at new listings. This were for 2020, I think we have basically the same structure for 2021, maybe even more you no know, tendency to listing sort of smaller micro cap companies. Uh, the the left-hand pie chart shows the number of years uh, it takes before they go public. And as you can see, a fairly big chunk, let's say 30% of the companies that go uh, go on the IPO route uh, uh, have, be, have been sort of doing that less than five years after their initial capitalization. So that's also something I think that makes uh, Sweden stand out in, in, in European uh, comparison. You can take the next uh, slide, please. So why is that? Um, well, Sweden in particular offer some specific condition that promotes listings and trading in young SME companies. Firstly, we have built a financial ecosystem uh, supporting SME companies, including three marketplaces for MTF listings. And we have a large number of well-qualified financial advisors 
specializing in serving the specific needs of just of, of those SME companies, just like Mangol, who is part of this uh, webinar today. Uh, secondly, we have a very strong savings culture and a pack, uh, pension and uh, tax system that promotes investments in stocks and mutual funds. Uh, thirdly, there is a strong interest and following from media, news wires and stockbrokers to cover SME companies both with equity research and, and business news. And finally, we have a very active retail community that understands the risks and have the appetite for investing in, in SME companies. And they also served by world-class e-brokers like Nordnet and Avanza to provide retail investors an easy access to trading listed companies on the MTL platforms. So those are sort of the key drivers, I would say. Uh, you can go to the next uh, slide, please. And this is NGM. Uh, Nordic growth market has a long history dating back to the early 80s and is one of the pioneers in listing Nordic SME companies. This star is the, the sort of 85 companies we have listed today. So we want to see our companies as sort of the stars, that the way we work. We really want to, to, to build a close relationship with, with our companies. Um, over the years, uh, we have developed a platform specifically built for SME companies and their specific needs. And that platform includes our MTF platform, Nord, uh, NGM Nordic SME, where we list most of the companies uh, over the last, last years. Um, we also offer the opportunity to parallel list stocks at Bush Stuttgart, our owner, owner. And we offer a fully regulated stock exchange, as Matthias said, and game main for those companies who want the highest quality stamp of approval. Um, the platform offers proven access to Swedish and institutional capital, as you can see on this slide, both uh, microcap uh, funds as well as large cap funds. And uh, we also provide, I would say, great liquidity for our traded companies, as you can see by the statistics. Um, next, next slide, please. Um, as a challenger, Nordic growth market has always promoted innovation and the partnership with our listed companies. Um, and as far as we know, we were the first stock exchange in the world to offer revenue share. And 25% of our trading revenues goes directly back to our listed companies, which is quite unique. And why are we doing that? You, we see this as a skin in the game. Uh, if our companies invest more in visibility, like building up IR and PR, liquidity and trading is likely to benefit, which is obviously good for a stock exchange. So this is a win-win. As a result, a third of our companies actually receive a net positive contribution being listed at the growth market. This is quite astonishing. Yeah, we yeah, see it like as a win-win as well, and that's why we copied you. Uh, we got some inspiration from you in Stockholm, and yeah. we introduced that model uh, last year with our list of companies, and I think it, it was well received. Yeah? Great. You can go to the next page. Another innovation is uh, our PEP market. It's actually a segment under our MTF Nordic SME list that allows for trading only one day a week on Tuesdays. And we see this as a sort of stepping stone towards continuous trading five days a week. Um, and we believe that concentrated liquidity like you can have on, on NGM PEP market uh, should provide for better pricing in the share and less volatility not at least for, for junior companies with limited free float. So we are really excited about this opportunity to list companies on NGM PEP market. We started this list in October last year, so it's, it's quite new. Uh, trading one day a week also uh, provide ample time for everyone to digest uh, company information to make informed trading decisions. So in our view, uh, this is a way of democratizing um, the capital markets. Uh, we can go to the final slide, please, or the, the next uh, final slide. Um, this slide shows uh, the traction, uh, and I say that our platform really delivers. And here are some key numbers. Since 2015, 
We have been growing from 30 to 84 listed companies. Uh, in, in 2021 alone, we listed 16 new companies on our platform. All our share index has grown on average with 23% per year up until uh, December 28th. And uh, our trading volume has grown on average with 80% per year over the last five years. And increased with more than 30 times, which is quite good, I would say. Uh, next slide, please. Um, I just want to finish a bit with, with the MTF uh, list and requirements. I think we can have that more in, in the Q&A, but basically uh, the popularity of listing MTFs in Sweden is, is mainly because of the sim simplified documentation. You need a company description rather than a full prospectus if you raise less than 2.5 million euros. Uh, and also the, we have a very rapid and straightforward listing process which typically takes somewhere between two and four months. So simple documentation and rapid process. Um, what we can say is that we, we require a qualified financial advisor in the listing process, such as Mangold, uh, and also a mentor to support the company for the, for the uh, two for first years. And the mentor is really for guiding the company in providing um, information and communicating with the, with the equity market and uh, for don't, not to break the more regulation, for instance. So this is uh, sort of a short introduction on the Swedish IPO market and on Nordic growth uh, market. So back to you, Matthias. Great, excellent. Yeah, then uh, let, let's move to our uh, panel discussion. Uh, Anders, what, do you, what you mentioned about the uh, Swedish uh, ecosystem uh, is very interesting uh, to me. I would like to, uh, to dig a little bit deeper on that subject. Um, can you explain a little bit more about the, um, the, the concept of mentor mentor certified advisors that you, that you have in in Sweden what are, what is yes. their role and 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 then Oscar can as a certified advisor mentor can can also add some details yeah as as a junior company our experience is that the the biggest sort of uh, uh, hurdle uh, is to communicate effectively with with the market when you're going from the private situation to public situation you have the regulation uh, and the more regulation is quite tricky and uh, so uh, we, we, as one way of supporting the companies, we say that we, we have a requirement of having this mentorship, which is, is an independent advisor. It could be the same financial advisor that is sort of guiding the company to the IPO, but it could also be a, a, an, another advisor that is just focusing on the, on the mentorship role. And uh, so, for instance, if you have a quarterly report or you have a, um, a, a PM going out, uh, you can send that beforehand to uh, to the mentor to discuss all the sort of the communication points so you don't break the more regulation for instance so that's a very good service uh, and even if we have just a requirement of two years uh, a lot of our companies continue with the mentorship uh, lifelong okay so but Oscar as a mentor you also have a role uh, pre pre IPO uh, can you talk about a little bit about your life as a, as a, as a mentor in, in supporting these firms? Yes, absolutely. Uh, before listing, summary, we, we make sure the company follows NGM rulebook. Uh, we screen the company's business operation, reputation, and the future prospect. Uh, we screen the company's management and board, the composition of the organization, and the individuals in terms of background and knowledge. We also help the company to review and adapt internal governing documents, routine documents, and information policy. Uh, we educate the company's management and board in information policy and other listing requirements. We're also investigating all submitted application documentation uh, for a co complete assessment of the company's uh, suitability for trading. Uh, and we also act like a bridge between the company, other advisors and the stock exchange under the listing process. Uh, and then after, uh, when you ring the bell and you are a listed company, uh, we act as a sounding board for the company regarding information policy uh, and for the board for the terms of NGM rulebook. Uh, we continue to train and update companies' management and board in current regulation as well as practice procedures, disciplinary matters, etc. Uh, we act first line control against company in terms of information policy, stock price, volatility. Uh, and uh, we also like correctly reading uh, press releases, ensure that uh, the company fulfilled the market abuse regulation 
uh, etc. So it's daily contact with our mentor companies. Yeah, I, I could add. Like, mm -hmm. Yeah, I can add to that. Uh, to, to Oscar said also, uh, uh, NGM has also the the sort of opportunity. We have, we have the we have the market surveillance operation as as part of our operations, and the companies listed uh, that has mentors can also uh, also call directly to our market surveillance, and also have the opportunity to speak to our people there. On, on the similar topics, uh, like for instance, if they want to send out a press press release, and if they wonder about how to 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 uh, uh, put a, what kind of messaging they put, want to put out, and how that will sort of uh, if they would break the or whatever. So we have that service, which is quite unique, even uh, if compared to our competitors, I would say. Yeah. How, how many firms uh, are acting as uh, as mentors in in Sweden, and how is quality uh, maintained? Well, we have about 20 firms that we approved for mentorship. Uh, so they are also sort of educated in, in as, as Oscar said, in the way we want them to work with, with the companies. Uh, uh, I'm not sure if you, uh, Nasdaq has another arrangement, but uh, for the growth market, it's about 20 firms. And I yeah. said, it, we have the requirement for two years. Uh, Nasdaq, I think, has this certified advisor for life. Yeah. And how, how do you ensure a continuous quality of, uh, of services that they provide? Do they well, need to be certified? Yeah, we, we are sort of having the initial education of them, of course, and then we get feedback from our listed companies, how they perceive the service, obviously. And we try to channel back that feedback to, to, the, to the mentors, so they could sort of improve on, on the things that they are not satisfied with. Yeah. And Thomas, the, the numbers that Anders presented uh, are quite impressive, I think. Um, why do you think that corporates in Switzerland and continental uh, Europe are rather hesitant vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, listening? I think there are several reasons for this besides the, the, the cultural reasons vis-a-vis uh, uh, -vis the financial market. But uh, the, the key determinant in, in the Swiss market, which is quite a, a good uh, or an efficient financial market with lots of interest is that we have uh, in Switzerland very easy or more easy access vis-a-vis -vis Sweden to venture and private equity capital. So this is one hurdle. Then before the financial crisis and all the, the banking regulation, it was uh, especially for, for all areas in continental Europe, uh, people were more linked to uh, banks financing or uh, debt credit uh, on the credit issues. And uh, in addition, I think that uh, the more distant, uh, uh, the more distance from the entrepreneurs to financial markets in continental Europe brings a situation that they fear a little bit about regulatory hurdles, about entry barriers to deal with all this question regarding uh, an IPO and they fear a little bit uh, the listing costs and uh, potential transparency in issues they were not uh, forced to to give to to everybody which uh, recently changed but uh, culture and uh, time is changing now and you have everywhere this uh, this more or less this transparency requirement so uh, as long as the the, the exchanges uh, also uh, would change a little bit in continental Europe and in Switzerland to, to a welcome culture and instead of impose lots of hurdles with uh, certified advisors and whatever and make it more easy easy access for everybody I think together with uh, with the ecosystem around these exchanges which uh, is able to point out uh, the, the benefits of being a listed company. This would uh, definitely uh, change, uh, change the sentiment towards uh, a listing. So the, the, the work we have to do now is uh, to, I mean, this is also something we have to do with all these uh, already listed companies below a market cap of 1 billion that the, at the SVX actually, we have to, to stress and to support these companies in learning and showing what they have to do and what are then the benefits of being a listed company and not just discuss about the hurdles, the cost, the regulatory requirements and all the, all the headwinds because 
uh, it's clear you cannot benefit from uh, being a listed company with a market cap of uh, 500 to 800 million and you just interact uh, two times per year when you have the annual report and half year uh, figures when you manage this like this then being a listed company ends up as a, a negative uh, thing, a hassle, and you don't uh, you don't can take the, the benefits from all this uh, from all this work. That's yeah, that's uh, this is rather the cultural thing on on the corporate side, which is even which we always we we also see on already listed companies, which are absolutely not uh, ready to to take the, the advantage. Yeah, I think we will uh, will need to discuss investors' uh, communication a, a little bit more in depth. Now, I, I would say let's make it more interactive for our audience. Uh, we have prepared an audience uh, poll. So the question uh, for, for you is, and uh, it's multiple choice, so you can uh, you should should select uh, two. What are the two most important drivers for the strong SME IPO market in Sweden, in your opinion? So one is strong retail investment at overall shareholding culture. Two is lean regulatory requirements, efficient listing process. Third, various mentors advices that actively promote IPO benefits. Fourth, widespread research analyst coverage that goes into communication. And fifth, tax incentive supportive pension system. So make your choices. Of two. Another five seconds for you to make your choice. Now we will look at the results. Okay, we have a, a clear winner here, a strong retail investment and overall shareholding culture that we will certainly discuss a little bit more together. Um, second is various mentors advices that actively promote IPO benefits. Yeah, I see. So, and widespread research analyst coverage is, uh, in, in fact, is only 9% only of the audience thought this would, would be a point. Now, um, Coming back to our experts, uh, Anders, uh, do, you, do you agree with the audience? Uh, what are, you, in your opinion, uh, the most important factors? Um, yes, I, I basically agree. It starts with sort of the shareholding culture we have in Sweden. That's sort of a very, very strong driver, of course, and has been there for, for a long time, uh, that people uh, invest actively in, in stocks and mutual funds. And uh, that's something that you can do very efficiently both through the sort of platforms we have, the brokers like Avanza and Ovnet, and that is also supported by the structure we have with tax efficient accounts, like ISK is called in Sweden. So uh, that's sort of the fundamental driver. Uh, then, then I think it's also, you know, you have, you have, um, you have an appetite for risk. I mean, uh, uh, if you look at uh, last year, for instance, small caps funds, we had a few of those small caps funds in Sweden that, generated over a six to seven percent return and people see that and they tend to invest uh, at least a portion of their their sort of money in, in those type of growth companies and uh, we have had a traction of those small caps fund the positive traction for quite a long time now so uh, uh, quite many of those funds, small cap funds that people invest in also, also sort of in in the individual companies um, and then we have of course we have some visibility uh, big visibility also in, in, in you know we are creating I think we have a very very strong entrepreneurial culture in Sweden over the last maybe 20 years and uh, we have created you know uh, a, a lot of um, of uh, unicorns I think we have compared to the rest of the world we have more unicorns per capita than anyone in any other region in the world except for Silicon Valley uh, and those unicorns like spot Spotify and, and Klarna and, and uh, some other those companies, uh, they have generated a lot of wealth, uh, both by the entrepreneurs, but also by the people working. You know, they have tech incentive programs, so they have generated wealthy people that continue on to, to be entrepreneurs and start their own startups and also have money to invest in other startups. So, you know, you have a positive spin on that. That is very, very strong in, in, in Sweden. So, um, 
you know, it's not going for us right now. Yeah, and uh, Oscar, uh, what about uh, what about your opinion uh, on the most important factors that makes Sweden so successful? Uh, I agree with Anders. It's uh, the shareholding culture. Uh, it's a long history, and also the history of growth tech companies. Uh, I think uh, not um, the tax incentive is not so a uh, big issue for us because before we have this. Uh, good tax uh, we don't we also have a good interest in uh, growth companies as well and in uh, in saving in shares do, do, you, do you have in, in sweden a, a particular focus on on the type of companies i heard that uh, like e-gaming is a uh, is quite a huge interest for companies to be listed there yeah i gaming uh, biotech companies uh, green tech companies uh, a lot of tech companies uh, one of the strongest, you know, the one, as you said, Oscar, one of the strongest momentums we see right now is, you know, for sustainability in green tech. And uh, the stock has been really a sort of a center of, of, of that in the world, uh, promoting a lot of you know, new startups in that arena. And uh, they have been starting up specialized VC funds, private equity funds, investing just in, you know, sustainability companies and clean tech. And those companies will eventually go to the stock market. So uh, that's that's a really strong trend. In addition to the gaming sector, as I said, Oscar, that's also very very strong in Sweden. Mm -hmm. So maybe not uh, not so long until we see uh, specific uh, ESG impact segments on on your stock exchange, Anders. Uh, on green tech. Yeah, yeah or, or or ESG in general. Uh, we we have already. Uh, uh, we already have companies with sort of a, a, a green tech profile listed and we had a lot of you know, requests from potential companies that we are looking at right now that are having sort of a, a clean tech and green green tech focus so that's something investors want to invest in both sort of individuals and and the small smaller market cap funds have, have a great interest in that okay now let's talk a little, a little bit more about the importance of uh, retail investors i as a retail-focused stock exchange in Switzerland, I find this uh, this quite uh, interesting for us as well. And um, so, Thomas, um, what are the main reasons um, when it comes to retail trading volumes? Um, um, there are a lot of different differences um, when we look at, uh, at various markets. So, how how can you explain differences? Like in the US, uh, uh, something like 25% uh, retail investor flow. Asia is 60% is even and and uh, Europe, on average, is only five to seven percent. How, how can the, this be explained in your opinion? Yeah, there, there are again a bit uh, cultural reasons. So uh, there's a lot of skepticism vis-a-vis -vis the financial markets, equity, uh, especially in equities uh, in the in the German-speaking uh, culture in Germany. But then another reason is that uh, due to our uh, pension fund system. Uh, that links the, the, a big part of the employer savings to to the responsibility of of uh, of the of the employer, which brings it in a pension fund solution. Uh, this means at the end that then uh, a big part of the money of the saving money for the for for the future is is goes away, and is delegated to to other people's decision framework. And uh, I think this is one one key reason that also has an impact on the distance to people to the developments of uh, of the final financial markets. So uh, it's very easy when you take a taxi in New York or London, you can discuss uh, with, at every price with the taxi driver about the impacts of inflation, about uh, about rates, about yields or no yields, negative yields, and uh, you realize that these people are very closely linked to the the overall financial conditions to the financial situation at the stocks exchanges and they have a they need to have a plan for their savings and uh, they're much closer and they're part of uh, they have to to do it in their own responsibility and this is not the case in uh, continental europe uh, also not in in switzerland I think now that via the digitalization and also thanks to the, the crypto, Bitcoin and all these new instruments, 
that also in continental Europe uh, with the next generation we will see here <clears throat> a new behavior and uh, as you know also the pension plan uh, uh, issues are in discussion to, to change it to uh, beneficial plans in, in Switzerland or other uh, uh, parts in Europe. I think uh, we will see there quite soon a, a huge new potential coming onto the market. And then I would also stress one third reason that investors in between uh, due to the globalization and this world is flat approach has realized that in the big blue chips names, you have this trend investing, which is far, which is in, in many cases far away from uh, corporate fundamentals. And this brings an increased interest in investing in local corporates where you see the company, where the company is your neighbor and you can easily invest in, uh, in, such, a, in such a company. So this means uh, there is also uh, some there are some developments on the way which we think will uh, change and open more trading volumes uh, quite soon. Okay, so you, uh, Thomas, you mentioned the Swiss pension system, uh, Anders and Oscar. How, how is this working in, in Sweden? Do you want to start, Oscar? Uh, you can start. Okay. <laughs> well, uh, obviously, you have you, we have a pension system where you uh, where you have sort of a, a general pension system, and then you have additionally, if you are sort of a professional, maybe you can add add-ons that the company pays in pensions. But then on top of that, people save themselves uh, for, for their pensions, and and I think uh, uh, over the last years, I think with the challenges of you know of the global economy, things like that, people tend to see that the state pension system is not enough so you, you need to sort of save yourself uh, in in stocks um, and bonds of course, or mutual funds so you have all three sort of sources of pensions both sort of the general pension uh, the, the corporate pension you get if you're a professional and then your, your sort of personal savings in, in pensions which is quite tax tax effective as we said okay. Oscar, anything to add? No, but uh, our uh, pension solution, you can save in uh, every group of companies that are listed. Uh, so if you have our solution, you can buy every stock on the NGM. And um, that is very unique uh, in the pension system as well. Mm. Okay. Uh, coming back to the, to the structure of investors that you have in Sweden, uh, how, how does the usual... Uh, um, investor look like what is it what is a typical investor in Sweden I can start on on how it looks like for NGM companies and maybe you also can talk about more in general but if we look at when we list companies a typical company has a size of maybe 10 to 20 million euros in market cap you know raising maybe two two million uh, euros uh, at, at the IPO and for those companies I would say maybe up to 100% is retail investors uh, of the free float uh, that you sort of look at. And then over time, as the company grows, hopefully, and you know the market cap maybe reach 30, 40 million, million euros, then you start to see institutional interest in, 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 the, uh, in the company. But from the start, it's mostly retail investing in those type of IPOs um, in general. And, and also you have, of course, entrepreneurs, family offices, smaller family offices, angel investors that could also be sort of like they are like semi-institutions semi that could sort of uh, take part of those pre-IPO financings or, or uh, the in the IPO process. Yeah. So in other terms, if you wouldn't have this strong re uh, retail uh, in investor participation in the market, uh, we wouldn't even see uh, this, uh, this many uh, small caps, uh, micro caps in Sweden, right? Well, well, once again, the question, I didn't hear you. What, the, what, you, what you're saying is, the, is that uh, without the retail investors' active participation in, in, in your market, um, small caps wouldn't even list, right? Because they, they cannot attract the uh, liquidity from the institutional side. Right, right. So that's something you earn over time. When you, you have some, some hurdles as an institution to invest in, 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 uh, in companies, of course, and, and market cap is one hurdle. Uh, because you have to have easy way in, easy way out as an institution to, to invest in those companies. So typically, I would say that hurdle is around maybe 30 to 40 million euros 
in order to, to attract ins institutional interest. Below that is, is quite difficult to, to, uh, to attract institutions. So those companies rely a lot on, on, the, on the retail shareholders for, for, you know, uh, for free float, but also for additional financing in, 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 uh, in right issues and things like that. Okay. <clears throat> How is the liquidity in general in SME stocks in Sweden? I would say in general it's quite good, isn't it, Oscar? Yeah, it's really good. If you compare it to other and other countries, we have the best liquidity in in SME companies. Mm. And uh, I think it sh showed on the chart that we have an, on average uh, liquidity of 100%, which may, means that the the, uh, the turnover, the stock turnover divided by market cap is is over, over one year is 100%, which is quite good even in, in the international comparison and of course it varies by company but still i think we have a very good uh, liquidity and uh, but at the same time liquidity is probably the, the top concern for for a list of small cap uh, how to sort of uh, increase liquidity in the share because that's important to to if you want to sort of raise new capital that you can trade it efficiently and everything you can do to increase the liquidity is obviously very important. And, and one way of doing that, as I said, with our revenue share, is to take those money and invest in PR and IR to increase the visibility. And, and we have 1,000 companies in Sweden. And uh, if you want to stick out among those 1,000 companies, that's quite a, quite a, a challenge, <laughs> I would say. So you, you need to work a lot with visibility and marketing and your branding and also investor relations to, to stick out. Okay, uh, Oscar, uh, how important in, in communication is uh, is analyst uh, research coverage? Uh, it's very important. Uh, you know, it's it's hard to get through the media noise when it's so many listed companies, uh, and companies often uh, had good communication before and in connection with IPO. They did roadshow marketing, uh, but uh, when they ring the bell, the company's management just relaxes. You know, so hard pressed, it's like, oh, thank God. But, you know, it's when all starts. So equity research is the aim of the company for investors. So you, you need to remind the investors what the company does and about the equity story. Uh, and uh, IR is also important. Use website, Twitter, LinkedIn to communicate. Uh, and company who use equity research have a lead when they reach milestones. Uh, and it's also imp important to participate in investor presentation and stock market events. And when you when you have an equity research, it leads to more shareholders, better liquidity, and it's also very important when you have to when you want to reach out to institutional investors as well. Mm. Yeah. I, I agree with Oscar because I think that's one of the sort of quality stamps that you want to see the institutional investors that you have uh, independent coverage of. Of the stock from from a stockbroker uh, that increase the transparency in, in the company of course and also i mean i'm sitting here now in our own studio and we're doing also a lot of events uh, from our platform with our companies uh, digital events so we assist our companies in 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 the visibility uh, for instance we have sector events where they won in gaming uh, last year with our i think we had six or seven gaming companies that are listed on our stock exchange and we'll do a lot more of this uh, this year so adding adding to our offering uh, as a stock exchange also in helping our campus with the visibility we, we think is quite quite important yeah yeah, yeah. And retail invest investors are like uh, goldfish so you, every time right one needs to remind them about what you do and about the equity story yeah, yeah. exactly uh, tell them what you it. intend to do and then do it do it do it all all the time basically exactly. so you, you and, need uh, to sort of create trust of course with the communication that's that's sort of the thing you can't just tell what you do and then you fail to do it because then you get punished so uh it's better to to be a, a bit you know conservative maybe sometimes when when you communicate but then just perform all the time uh so that's that's how you create trust uh perform each quarter that's the best best thing you can do yeah. Yes. And what what is your your role when it comes to communication? Uh, your role as a mentor, Oscar. Uh, communication. Uh, we read the press releases uh, and the financial reports, but uh, the the company uh, we don't force them to communicate IR. They need to have IR themselves and also use uh, equity research. 
so we have equity research called Mangle Insight, and uh, that's the department who who uh, communicates with uh, retail investors. Hmm. And, and I, I, I typically say that when you to our companies that uh, the best way to start is your, with your own digital sort of platform with your web page have a world-class web page of course but because that's where most people most uh, stakeholders first go to to get information about you and then work with your own digital channels like linkedin and, and maybe twitter as oscar said uh, but also when it comes to ir it's that's a long-term long-term work uh, you have to build relationships with analysts and with investors uh, and that takes time to, to, to get them, uh, educate them on your equity story. And, and then maybe over a year or two, then you maybe get their interest and they start to write an analyst piece or they invest in your company. Same thing goes for, for journalists to get your sort of name out in media. You have to build relationships with journalists. So you start to educate them for six months, 12 months, and then they, may, they call you uh, and you become a spokesperson for a specific topic or when they want to hear about your sector, then you can have a comment in, in, in a piece of media. Mm -hmm. I maybe can add here uh, something for the situation in, in, in Switzerland. So we have uh, definitely uh, no uh, information uh, information overkill out of the small and micro ca uh, caps or mid cap segment. In, in contrast, there is many media houses are very keen to to pick up these uh, stories and to publish uh, to publish news flow because we're basically linked to this uh, blue chip uh, swx uh, uh, listings and on the on the other side we we don't have enough information and the, the other point is what the, what the corporates should should really realize that you have communication which is just pure communication and then you have investor relation which is a specific way to communicate with investors and the third point is that you need independent research and cannot uh, take a bank's department and uh, give independent uh, opinions in the market and uh, at the same time this bank is uh, is uh, doing the mission of an issue so i think there we have a little uh, a little bit the problem where we have to 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 stress to the companies that they have to really decide in which case they work with which partners uh, together because when you you uh, give money to somebody to provide a research report with which is then issuing your your bond issue i mean then nobody will follow you at the end then uh, for everybody it's obvious that this is uh, this is not uh, not the best way to to do it and there is uh, some lack of independence mm -hmm. Thanks. Yeah, we, before we, uh, we we continue and pick up some of the questions in the audience, we, we received uh, quite a few. Um, I would uh, also like to, um, to to move to the topic of uh, the listing process. So I heard that, that your listing process in, in Sweden, Stockholm, is, uh, is very eff efficient. So th how, how long does it usually take uh, for a firm to get listed? I would say it takes somewhere between two to four months. Uh, could it be quicker? Uh, depending on how prepared the company is, and if, uh, if you if a company, for instance, uh, engage in in a, a bigger M and A transaction during the listing process, they need to, to produce pro forma statements and things like that. So that can that can take longer time, but typically two to four months. And we we really want to meet companies early on, maybe one year before they uh, start the listing process, to educate them about how, the way we work with this, these things. Uh, and uh, maybe the second or third meeting with them, they bring financial advisor like Mangold uh, to our meeting, and then they they uh, send in. I mean, the, the formal process starts with that the board uh, send in a formal request that they want to be audited if, for for listing at, at Nordic Growth Market. So uh, from there, then the the uh, financial advisor uh, jointly together with the company start to prepare the necessary documentation and. The, the so the biggest part of that is the company description that is basically a, a mini prospectus, maybe 40 to 50 pages. That is mm -hmm. a part of the, 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 the diligence process, but also a marketing document when you want to sort of attract the capital uh, in, in the capital raising during the IPO. And uh, as Oscar said, also they, they prepare a, a, a information policy 
and we want the, the financial advisor also to conduct a, a fit and proper due diligence of, of the, uh, the leadership and, and the board uh, in the firms, we go through criminal records and things like that. So when all this is finalized, uh, our listing committee uh, at NGM approves the company for listing, uh, conditional upon that the company really fulfills the free float requirement that we have of at least 300 shareholders. So that's basically the, the, the process. So quite simple, efficient, interactive with the company and, and with the financial advisors. I think that it is a very robust process that works very very well. I'm not sure, Oscar, if you we, we work closely related with Mango, so we have experience working together. Yes, uh, and the listing process also depends how big the company are. Uh, so sometimes it takes three months, and sometimes it takes twelve. Hmm. And then you have this capital hurdle of 2.5 million euros. If you raise more money at the IPO, more than 2.5 million euros, you have need to produce a prospectus instead of, of, of a company description. And that, that's a, bit, a little bit more work, of course. Yeah, exactly. And more costs. Uh, so it's uh, often one month or more uh, if you write the prospectus instead of a uh, only a company description and the memorandum. Yeah, and I just may want to comment on the cost also of listing. We have an audit fee, which is a one-time audit fee, which is about 18,000 euros. And then we have an annual listing fee of about 14,000 euros on NGM Nordic SME. So uh, it's not that expensive actually to be listed. Uh, on top of that, you have the mentorship, which is, is about some, somewhere between 12,000 and 16,000 euros a year. For two years, um, yeah. and also you, you, when you work with the capital raisings, you have maybe success fees and things like that you work with. Yeah, but if you take um, include a legal advisor, financial advisor, including mentor and, and uh, NGM's cost and, and marketing as well, it's uh, I think it's between two hundred to three hundred thousand euro, and then plus success fee for the money you raise if you do an IPO and uh, not a direct listing. Mm -hmm. I see. Thank you. Um, yeah, we have another uh, like 10 minutes remaining in our we webinar, so I will pick up some of the questions from the audience. Um, one was, how does the independent research provider in Sweden finance his operations? So that question goes to you, I think, Oscar. Yeah, what was the question again? How, how do you find, as, a, as an independent uh, research analyst, how do you finance your operations? How is the research finance? What model it's, is applied? It is commissioned, uh, commissioned research. Uh, uh, after MIFID II, uh, almost every uh, research in Sweden is commissioned from the company. So the company pays for the, for the research. Yeah. Mm. And Oscar, how, how, how much is that between, you know, very roughly, how much do your company pay if you want to have coverage for six pieces or four pieces a year or something like that? Is it? Yeah, in, including CEO interviews, uh, investor meetings, uh, as well, it's uh, 30,000 uh, euro per year, give yeah. and take. Okay, okay. <clears throat> Uh, under, you mentioned uh, 2 million uh, Euro uh, IPOs, also the very, very small uh, micro cap ones. Uh, how does that work if you compare it with the costs? It must be clearly on a double digit percentage, right? Isn't that too expensive? Well, our listing cost, you know, from, from NGM point of view is, is not that big, of course, compared to those 2 million. And Oscar said, if you're looking at the total cost of, of going to the stock market, including uh, capital raising, and so you somewhere between, uh, as you said, uh, 200, 300. So that's maybe 10 percent, 10 percent total of, of of the raised capital, which is a sort of a benchmark in Sweden. Uh, it has been so for for quite a while, and uh, people tend to see this as as a good investment in, in, in becoming public. Um, yeah. Uh, uh, of course, if you have if you have a bigger capital raise, I mean, if you have a success fee on that capital raise, I mean, that will be more money as well for 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 the advisors. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. 
Okay, but it, your model still works for the two million uh, IP, IPO. That's that's good. Um, so another question uh, from the audience: What's your advice on how to train, educate retail investors so they are willing to invest in stock market? This needs to be done even before you remind them every now and again to invest, right? So that's that's a question uh, to you. So what what you, needs to be done in order to train uh, in investors, to in retail investors? you have to speak their language you can't speak when you are a biotech company you communicate with market but you need to speak their language and not uh, technical language i think it's very important uh, in, i think it's a, a big gap there what do you think anders yeah i think that's uh, that's a good point uh, oscar when you when I talk about the storytelling, uh, which is quite important, you know, in, in increasing the visibility, a lot of companies are very technical, describing their 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 what they do basically and and the equity story. I think you could be much more speaking in layman terms, uh, in terms, and that's an art to learn, and that's something I think we also as a stock exchange try to to say to our companies that. When you communicate, you have to speak with the same language as as the people that invest in you, uh, retail and, and investors, two different audiences. Um, we, as a stock exchange, has has something called Investigar SM, which is a competition that we have uh, uh, each year in October or November. Uh, we had last year, we I think we had six thousand competitors, basically retail, that we have using token money and they can invest in 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 stocks and uh, and uh, other instruments at our stock exchange for one week and it's a competition the one who, who gains the most uh, uh, returns wins and, and gets gets sort of prizes for that but that's basically a way of educating educating uh, the uh, the retail about investing in different type of instruments without losing real money yeah, yeah. and also tell them about the risk as well Exactly, exactly. And then also retail community has a lot of, you know, chat sites in, in on, on social media where they talk about uh, micro caps a lot and how to invest in micro caps, what's going for them, what's not going for them. And of course, that has always two ways, you know, regulatory reasons means that you can push a stock that is not good, but also it's good information channel and learn about how we invest in growth companies, of course. Okay, so as a last question from the audience, I think uh, I, we got a very good one uh, for, for that. And um, so from a Swedish uh, perspective, uh, Anders and Oscar, how would you start to promote SMEs in Switzerland? Uh, how we start to promote uh, Swedish companies to, or uh, Switzerland companies? Also, if if you would put up tent here in Switzerland and uh, and move to the, the, to Switzerland, uh, uh, live here, and uh, then you would be active in in the SME uh, segment. Uh, how, how would you start to promote the uh, SME listings here in Switzerland? I would start, you know, with with as we said here in Sweden, with with the regulation, make it easy, make it easy, and then then. Uh, I think the ecosystem surrounding uh, SME listings is quite important with big companies like Mangold to have uh, qualified advisors that have an experience with working with the listing of SME companies and, and the special things they need help with, uh, holding hand basically for, for, for the entire process. Yeah, and also, uh, you know, um, help the company with the liquidity to explain the importance to communicate with the retail investors and to reach out to, to retail investors. I don't know, Thomas, maybe have uh, some more experience from retail investors in Switzerland. Uh, can you speak uh, about uh, reach out to retail investors in, uh, in Switzerland? Yeah, I think you have there uh, in the e-banking and digital version, you have a lot of new tools and you just need to, to feed them with good stories like uh, we can learn from the, from the Bitcoin cryptocurrency scene. Uh, there I think the, the, it is open and there is not an overfeed of information. And I would also add maybe here the idea that uh, if you would already attack or not attack or uh, 
start to work much better with uh, all the already listed companies, this would be the, the, the perfect example to show potential candidates what are the benefits of being a listed company, even when you have only a market cap of uh, 250 or uh, 500 uh, million. And I think uh, there is the, the lowest hurdle to, to maybe start to bring the equity segment more in, in favor of corporates, retail investors, and also institutional investors, because we should not forget the institutional investors could also bring their money on the table, maybe not via one direct investment, maybe via collective investment plans where they can say, okay, uh, based on scientific studies, the performance of growth or small caps is normally much better than the, the blue chips. So they could uh, they could start to, to put their money on the table there. So yeah, many ways. <laughs> I also okay. think it's important to have uh, one or two success stories to show, showcases companies that have really succeeded in doing uh, an SME IPO uh, that has been well received in the market. Uh, so people can look at those companies. Yeah. yeah. So we want to get the, our own unicorns. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, with a good quality standpoint as well. So it, it's also important that the, the companies has a quality stamp uh, and credibility. So, um, good uh, listing process uh, as well. Okay, gentlemen, uh, it was a pleasure having you on the, on the webinar. Thanks to the audience uh, for, for your time and attention. Uh, we'll close the webinar now. Uh, there will be a recording uh, and that will be made available afterwards. So, thanks uh, everyone. Andres, Oscar, Thomas, thanks a lot for your participation. Thank, Thank you. you. So Have a good day. Thank you so much. Thank you.